We are right. Good evening, all. Welcome to iFocus Online, episode three one seven, the eighth in the Back to Basics module. Today we have with us the very learned Dr. Sabhyasachi Sen Gupta from Future Vision and Sen Gupta Research Academy, Mumbai, to speak to us on essentials of medical statistics for an ophthalmologist. Dr. Sen Gupta has a diploma in ophthalmology from the prestigious Jipmer Eye Institute and DNB from Arvind Pondicherry. He is a research cum clinical fellowship in vitreo retina from Shankar Netralaya. He has a research fellowship at the Wilmer Eye Institute, John Hopkins, USA, and is currently a vitreo retina surgeon practicing at the Future Vision Eye Care, Mumbai. He is an ex associate editor of the Indian Journal of Ophthalmology, and was awarded the Mac. Cartney Prize with the Royal College of Ophthalmologists, London, in 2010, and is the first ever non-British national to receive this award. He also has to his credit Dr. G. Venkat Swami gold medal in DNB Ophthalmology, and has published 100 plus papers in index peer-reviewed journals. He was included in the top two percent of the global researchers list by the Stanford University for 2021. He is the founder of Sen Gupta's Research Academy, a one of its kind portal offering e-learning lectures on research methodology and services for manuscript preparation. Over to you, sir. Thank you so much, everyone. And, uh, you know, so we are back with part two of, uh, you know, what we started a couple of days back. And let me quickly share my screen. Okay. Yeah, you know, so like last time we saw that there are so many different you know, things that need to be done, including, you know, thinking of a thesis or, or not just a thesis, but any research topic, then, you know, designing the study using that PICO approach or the PICOT approach, uh, you know, then collecting data and <clears throat> analyzing it. And then finally writing that paper up. You know, so we saw pretty much a lot of uh, certain non-negotiables and basics about designing the study and uh, writing it up as well as how you can, you know, choose a journal for writing the paper, but then what we did not look at was biostatistics uh, and the, on that day because it's impossible to you know cover this along with those other topics. So you know today we'll be looking at biostatistics, but then hopefully some of you have attended the previous session and are also live now. So I just wanted to you know sort of ask you how is the Josh? Uh, you know I, I'm sure I'm not going to get uh, a, a response from you because all of you are listening uh, virtually, but then you know, I hope your Josh is high and that you're looking forward to this session, though it is not an easy uh, topic to explain. You know, like I said, uh, you know, doing research is all about asking questions, you know, so I'm going to put a quick uh, video from Dr. Amod Gupta's interview that I took uh, you know, a couple of years back, and this is what he has to say about asking questions. Uh, you know, and this is, I had shown a couple of slides from uh, you know, from other films, but, you know, I generally like to include some Bollywood because otherwise it really becomes uh, extremely boring, you know, so I'm sure you, all of you have seen this movie, um, Three Idiots, and if you haven't, then you're really missing out something in life, you know, so uh, Ranchod or Rancho in the movie really says, Bacha kabil bano kabil, kamyabi to jhak mare ke piche bhaage ki, right? So don't just chase success, you need to chase excellence and success will very much follow, you know, and the same goes not only for clinics, but also for, for research. So it's not going to happen overnight. Let's quickly hear Dr. Amad Gupta and see what he talks about when he talks about uh, you know, asking questions. Is there any special message for young researchers who are watching this episode? For the young researchers uh, and young doctors, uh, uh, my parting advice would be to not stop asking questions. What I say is, before you learn the answers, learn to ask questions. In my paradigm, uh, learning questions, uh, how to ask a question, how to frame a question, how precise you should be in asking that question and asking your query, I think that's what with the availability of uh, uh, Google and such uh, uh, search engines, uh, it's so easy to find whatever is known about a particular subject, about a particular aspect of a question. And you need to find out the outer boundaries of knowledge. You, you need to figure out what questions have no answers. And those are the questions you need to chase uh, in your research. They, they are the questions which you should frame your 
uh, research grants and uh, you know research questions and try to figure out the answers. And I'm sure all those answers that you find, all those uh, papers that will emerge would have a huge impact uh, uh, all over the world. You know, so, uh, Professor Amit Gupta has been a huge inspiration for me for the last decade or so, and you, know, you can watch his interview and interview of so many others, including Dr. Santosh and Dr. Virendra Sangwan and others on the Sengupta Research Academy uh, website. Uh, I think I've been introduced enough, so you know, I'll quickly <clears throat> skip this slide. And I think I had shown this to you the last time as well. So this is, yes, you know, some of the, uh, or rather the footprint of Sengupta Research Academy across the world map where we have more than 5,000 students from two countries. Uh, so we are looking at, you know, data analysis and interpretation today, isn't it? That's because, you know, biostatistics really means data analysis and, and its interpretation, you know, and what that data or the data that you are going to collect then we're going to collect and store it in say in an Excel sheet. Now the data really has to go from that Excel through a, a tube and come out on the other side as a result section of a manuscript, right? That's all your result section of your thesis, you know, or, or whatever you're writing. So, you know, the data will not itself, you know, magically turn out into the result section of the paper. You need to think about how you will do it and you need to visualize that result section, even when the data is coming through and later on, even before you have started collecting data, you need to visualize how that result section of the paper is going to look like, you know, and what are the things that you will need. So you will not miss out on things uh, and measuring a few things and you will carry out analysis properly so that that research question is answered, isn't it? So that result section is going to be really important and data analysis and interpretation will lead to the result section of the paper. And that is what we are looking at. But essentially that visualization ability is something that you need to develop, you know, even before. So, you know, I'm going to quickly play you a 30 second clip on what visualization means, you know, and you know how you can do it. Visualization, the recreation of images, sounds, and environments before it has happened is one of the most powerful skills in the world. A very powerful meditation and mindfulness practice, visualization has been used for centuries to help prepare the mind, the body, and the consciousness for upcoming challenges, situations, and circumstances. Some of the world's greatest athletes use visualization as a way to prepare for big games, the big day, musicians for their new concerts and tours, and CEOs for their very important meetings. Yes, yeah, so why only CEOs and, and concerts and others, you know, even physicians, you know, even subconsciously do this, you know, when you have a difficult surgery coming up the next day, you know, there's going to be fake odonesis and, you know, things like that, then you are automatically replaying that surgery before it has happened in your mind, isn't it? That's visualization. So, you know, it comes relatively naturally to us when we're talking about a clinical scenario or rather a surgical scenario, but not when we're talking about research as yet, right? Because it hasn't gotten ingrained deep within us. So, uh, you know, think about that. And, you know, like he's saying, you know, you don't need to visualize what these tables and figures need to look like and how am I going to, uh, you know, present my data crisply in, in these tables, etc. You know, so we'll take a look at how you can do all of this. You know, this is something that I showed you last time also. So, you know, plan and execute the study, then you analyze, write it up and you uh, review and <clears throat> you submit and publish it in a particular journal. And this is the pipeline generally. So, you know, the idea comes, so we've discussed about where you can get ideas from. And if you haven't uh, seen the previous, uh, you know, lecture, please do that. Then how you can design the study and how that design will be most suited to your studies in it. So what is the best design for my study is something that we have answered again in the previous uh, lecture. Uh, now we are going to look at execution and analysis. And we have also looked at writing and publishing in the, in the previous section, right? So today we are really going to look at execution and analysis. And that really means biostatistics, right? So, you know, let's uh, really get underway. Uh, you know, before that, let's look at a question or let's look at a sentence that you will come across in published papers, left, right, and center, you know? So the statement says the central macular thickness reduced from 480 plus or minus 130 microns to 320 plus or minus 80 microns with aflibercept injection and from 489 plus or minus 140 microns to 340 plus or minus 90 microns with ranibizumab at three months follow up. You know, so uh, the ones in red are afl aflibercept and the ones in blue are uh, ranibizumab results, right? So 480 
and 489 were preoperative macular thickness and 320 and 340 are postoperative macular thickness <coughs> right so that there is almost similar reduction as we can eyeball and see a reduction in central macular thickness in these two groups was comparable without any statistical significance in the p value 0.63 so what does this p value mean and where did this come from you know and what tests are going on in the background that we are getting this p value so this is not significant right p any p less in more than 0.05 is not significant and any p less than 0.05 so 0.049 or 0.04 0.03 is statistically significant now what does this p value mean p really stands for probability and a very easy way to look at it is if you repeat the same experiment or the same study 100 times you know how many times is that outcome likely to happen because of chance and how many times will that outcome repeat itself again and again right so 0.63 means 63% of the time the same outcome will happen because of chance right say so 0.05 that means 95% of the times you will get the same result 5% of the times you will get a different result because of chance but 95% of the times you will get the same result over and over again if p is 0.01 that means 99% of the times you're going to get the same result it's you know it's just giving you that uh, robustness to believe something isn't it and if it's a you know if it is 0.07 that means you're going to get the same result 93% of the times you're getting that right so you know if the p is 0.06 that means you're going to get the same result 94% of the times right so a p of 0.04 and a p of 0.06 is not really that hugely different isn't it so that's how that's how you should know how to interpret p values right so any p value which is more than 0.05 but less than 0.1 you know it is really it's something that you need to also think about and you know i tend to think that you know there probably is a difference because that's really too close to 0.05 anyway so you know what we are trying to understand is how the sentence came about what are the tests which are done at the back end of this to get this p value right also you know if you see these pre operative values 480 and 489 they are really close right this is almost clinically not meaningful however when you see later on that difference has increased to you know say 320 and this is 340 now this is a 40 micron difference right so and the drop here is uh, or the decreased uh, macular thickness has decreased more in this red group or aflibercept compared to uh, ranibizumab group right so decrease is about 150 microns here and 170 microns in aflibercept group right now that is clinically you can't differentiate whether it is significantly different or not right suppose one group dropped the uh, macular thickness by 150 microns and the other group dropped the macular thickness by only 30 microns that's a no brainer right that one group is superior to the other by a long way there you don't need to do any statistics just eyeballing the uh, the values will just tell you but when it is this close you are not really sure clinically you know some will say oh yes some will say no that is when you need to do statistics right so when you are not sure about the outcomes clinically that is when you actually need statistics we will you know we'll come back to this question later on and understand you know what is going on here another question is about causality association you know, what comes first and then does it cause the other? So here, if somebody compares the lipid profile of 50 patients with glaucoma and 50 age match controls and shows that 60% of glaucoma versus 15% of control has dyslipidemia and the T0.03, like I said, you know, this is an absolute no-brainer, right? One is 60% and one is 15%. It's hugely different. Can you conclude that dyslipidemia is a risk factor for glaucoma? And just think about it quickly. Now here, your outcome is glaucoma. And what is that thing which is going to cause glaucoma? This is dyslipidemia. Right? Now, can you start with glaucoma and then look back and see how many or look at how many are dyslipidemia? Is that the right approach? So in other words, is dyslipidemia associated with an increased risk of glaucoma? This, this is what the authors are trying to say. And this is a published paper very recently in one of the top journals. You can't start with glaucoma right here. You need to start with people with dyslipidemia and people without dyslipidemia and follow them up over a period of time or whatever, four years, five years, I don't know how long. And then say this dyslipidemia group, 10% developed glaucoma. And then the people who didn't have dyslipidemia and continue to not have dyslipidemia, only 3% developed glaucoma. That is when you can say, isn't it? So 
the starting point has to be that risk factor and then you go ahead in time you know that is that would have been the right way to do it isn't it also if you want to start with this lipidemia and do a retrospective or a cross sectional study like this at that same time point you can just look at 100 people with this lipidemia 100 people without this lipidemia and then see how many have glaucoma but you cannot start with glaucoma straight away so this approach is not helping with causality right and but then you know so again we'll look at some of these percentages later on and see how this p value came across but you know this is how statistics can uh, you know these are some of the sentences very similar to this you are likely to see in many many or in all sorts of published papers so how do you know what is right what is not right you know we are going to uh, you know that approach that i'm going to teach you is going to uh, help you do that this is a uh, ebook of basics of biostatistics and whatever i am going to talk now is present in this ebook it's really simplified. I think it's about five or six pages alone. I'm going to show you a, a QR code. And if you're watching on your laptops, then you can actually quickly scan it with your phones. If not, and you're watching a recorded video of this, you can actually look at it on the laptop or one screen and then use your phone. Just open the camera of your phone and just screen this. You know, uh, Once you scan this, it will take you to a page where you have to enter some basic details. And then that ebook will be free to download for you right uh, so you know this is something i'm just going to leave it on for say about 10 seconds or so you know if you have your devices and you're live now you can actually do it right away and uh, you know i'm going to also show this qr code uh, slightly later in the presentation so we'll have time to look at it again now let's look at some basic terminologies you know let's leave everything behind you know all that means and p values and all that let's start from scratch so what is data? What does it really mean? It's just that observation that come from an experiment or research, when they're all put together in one place, it means data, right? So last time, like I was saying, you know, data is the new currency and that very much is, right? But then it has to be organized. It has to be put up well, okay? So data really means all observations put together. Variable, a variable means each set of observations in the data set or every column in an Excel sheet is a variable. Now, where in the Excel sheet, we put each patient or each eye as a separate row and each column as a separate, uh, you know, unit that you're measuring, say age, gender, BCBA, OCD, thickness, number of injections, etc. These are all separate columns in the Excel sheet. And if you're making an Excel properly, so every column in an Excel sheet is a variable and all those variables put together is nothing but data. So variables really are of two main types. One is a continuous variable and another is a categorical variable. And a categorical variable can be either binomial, ordinal or multinomial. Now we'll see what these mean. What is continuous, what is categorical. Other ways, data could also look, uh, you know, be called as an independent variable. Uh, I mean, a variable could also be called as an independent variable and dependent variable. You know, when you look at the example of dyslipidemia and glaucoma, you, know, you have to think which is the independent variable and which is the dependent variable. You know, so the authors are concluding that dyslipidemia leads to development of glaucoma. People at, with dyslipidemia are at higher risk for developing glaucoma. So which is the influencer variable here? You know, which is the one which is causative or independent? That is dyslipidemia, right? So in that example, dyslipidemia becomes an independent variable and glaucoma becomes the dependent variable, right? So there's something that you can, you may or may not think about immunity, but you must understand whether the variable that you're looking at is a continuous or a categorical variable. Let's see what these are. So continuous variable, it's also called as a quantitative variable. You know, it's a variable that can take on many different values and any value from lowest to the highest point on a measurement scale, whatever you're using, it always has a unit to it, you know? So examples are age, which the unit to it is years and it can vary from a few months to like 90, sometimes hundred. BCBA is best corrective visual acuity. It can vary from you know, finger counting to 20 by 20, right? And in logmar, that really, uh, you know, translates from zero to two. Intraocular pressure rate is measured in, in millimeters of mercury and it can vary from, you know, as low as two and one to as high as 60, 70, depending on the, uh, you know, the study that you're doing. Central foveal thickness, central nerve, uh, retinal nerve fiber layer thickness, these are all measured in microns, right? So all of them have a unit to it and, you know, they're not restricted to any number, but then they can take on any value that is allowable in that. This is a continuous variable, right? Now let's look at what is a categorical variable. This is also called as a qualitative variable where things are grouped according to some common property, right? So it can, that variable can only have a limited number of values, right? So example is gender. You can only have female, male and female and 
perhaps others or you know undisclosed or something success could be yes no or you know partial complete or something like that based on how you have defined it but you can't have like 10 different types of success types of macular hole closure after surgery it could be either type 1 or type 2 closure or a non closure you know so these are all so that column is going to have only two or three possibilities types of neovascular membranes either classic or occult you know or it could be like minimally classic predominantly classic occult you know things like that but the only three or four types types of injections if you are doing a study like that it could be a vast in a lucentis or uh, eccentrics whatever or intravitreal trans in alone types of injury is either open lobe or closed lobe you know you can't have you can have both sometimes uh, you know in one and the other eye but then <clears throat> it's either open or closed lobe you know you can't have like 10 different types of injuries so uh, these are only a limited number of values and remember that these can't of course have any unit to it right so category can be either only two categories that is a yes no or a success failure or something like that so it's binomial by is two so only two categories possible right male female success failure or whatever uh, other is ordinal variable where more than two categories are possible okay but uh, there is an order to them okay so it could be complete success qualified success or failure just give me one second yeah okay so uh, ordinal will be more than two categories which are possible right but it could be uh, when it's more than two and they are uh, you know related to each other in an order then we call it an ordinal variable right so complete success qualified success and failure another example which is commonly used is <clears throat> is diabetic retinopathy you say mild npdr moderate npdr severe npdr you know very severe npdr early pdr uh, advanced diabetic eye disease uh, you know high risk pdr and all of that right so there is an order to it right so uh, patient won't directly land up into the latest stage they'll all go through that so ordinal variable someone which has order and when there are more than two categories but there is no order to that it is called multinomial variables right so example say type of injection in a study there are three or four different types of injection uh, in a study that you are using that becomes a multinomial variable let's do a quick exercise where the first question is height of subretinal fluid in central serous chorioretinopathy so i am a retina surgeon right so <laughs> most of my examples are going to be with retina so height of subretinal fluid in central serous retinopathy you know just think about it uh, you will measure it using the oct you know and that height of that fluid will be expressed in microns and it could really be anywhere between 1 and 2 microns to anywhere between 200 300 microns sometimes in very uh, you know large csrs so this is expressed in microns and it can vary from 1 and 2 to as high as 200 300 this is an example of a continuous variable right the next question is presence absence of hard exudates in diabetic macular retina there are only two either presence or absence there is no unit here of course you know some patient will have and some will not have so this is an example of a categorical variable when there are only two possibilities so this is a binomial categorical variable then you say response to intravitreal trans in alone where it's a good fair and poor based on how you have defined it right so that outcome is good fair and poor it's more than two categories of course this is a categorical variable but there are three more than two and it's in an order so this is an example of an ordinal categorical variable then next question is number of days of follow up of a patient you know so uh, it's going to be in you know it could very well vary from one or two days to say 100 days 365 days 720 days right so that is going to be it the unit of this is in days and this is an example of a continuous variable so uh, once we have variables you know once you starting to uh, get them what we do is we put them in the excel sheet right and once we have an excel sheet done only then can you start analysis so making an excel sheet is really really important and uh, this qr code will actually take you to the uh, youtube lecture on making an excel sheet right so an excel sheet really needs to be made so that it is understandable uh, very easily and also it can be utilized for statistical analysis right so just go through this lecture uh, on making an excel sheet and, and uh, you know i'm sure most of you will find it uh, you know very very useful and that you will look back at some of your excel sheets and say oh we gave the statistician a hard time right so uh, take some time off Uh, not immediately of course but you know whenever later you get time just also visit this uh, lecture on youtube so that you can uh, you know understand how to make a good excel sheet now once you have all these variables in place 
you know, your actual the data is started to come in. What we look at is now we look at one variable at a time, you know, so that is one column of uh, each column of the Excel sheet one at a time. We're not at all talking about multiple variables, you know, so, you know, when somebody enters a cricket field, he's a batsman or a batter. And, uh, you know, what you see first is his name and his, you know, previous record, how many centuries he scored, all of that average. And then he starts playing, isn't it? So you are getting information about that person or all description about that individual. And then later on, he's going to, uh, you know, start playing and they're all going to start interacting with each other. So what we're talking about is describing that one variable at a time, right? So this, this is called descriptive statistics at the bottom. As you can see, it is called descriptive statistics, right? Now, continuous variables are described as either mean with standard deviation or median with interquartile range range and then you can have some i'll explain to you what these are these are called you know, then, then what who are the outliers and the best way to show them graphically is using a box and whisker plot i'll also explain to you in the next slide what this means but really when you're looking at a continuous variable you know say age you will describe it in terms of mean standard deviation with us with a plus or minus standard deviation so you'll say mean age of patient was say in a cataract surgery patient you know paper you will say mean age was 68 plus or minus five years or whatever, right? You could also say the median with interquartile range. Median means the central value, you know, if you arrange all of these numbers in an ascending or a descending order, the value which falls right in the center of that is called the median, right? The uh, And so median really means 50th percentile, okay? So you can also describe that continuous variable in terms of uh, a median. Now, where this is more important, so most 90% of papers that are published, you will see means and you don't see medians, right? So when do you use mean and when do you use median, right? That's that's an important question. So, you know, if, if you have uh, too many extreme values, you know, say most people are between 40 and 50 years of age, and then you have some eight or nine who are 85 and 90, you know, so if you add all of them or if you average all of them, that average or that mean is going to be closer to that 90, no? So your mean age may be like 60 or 65. But if you exclude them, if you throw them out, those extreme values, if you throw them out, then your mean age suddenly becomes 45, right? So when you have many extreme values, then using mean is going to pull that mean towards itself. That is when you will have a large standard deviation, okay? So when you have many extreme values, you will have a mean with a large standard deviation, right? Because the deviation is too large, right? Between the smallest and the largest. So there's a lot of variation around it. So the standard deviation will be more than half the mean in, in that situation. And that is called a non-normal distribution or a non-parametric distribution. So when you have a large standard deviation, okay, that is called a non-parametric distribution. Now, what is large? What is large enough, right? When the standard deviation is more than half the mean, you know, say 60 plus or minus 30 years. That means that standard deviation is already large. You know, when you have a mean, when you, you know, you may be getting your results from a statistician and you see that mean age is, or say mean, mean intraocular pressure is 15 plus or minus 12. That means there are a lot of extreme values, right? So that is the time when you report median. And that median in that study, uh, you know, that median will be much lower than the mean that way, right? So when you have extreme values, then you generally report median with interquartile range. Then you, of course, have range, which is the smallest and the largest value. Then you have something called outliers. Outliers, like I've already told you, these are like extreme values, right? Very, very far away from the central tendency or the central median value. So they're very far away. And then you have box and whisker plots, which are showed, which show this continuous variables graphically. Now, this is an example of a box and whisker plot. And some of you may have seen it before and are aware of how this is done. Some of you are probably not. Just let me explain to you what this means. As you can see, there is a central box here and, you know, whiskers really in English means uh, mustache, muche, right? So this, this looks like a central box with some uh, mustaches around it, right? And this is the extent of the, uh, of the uh, whiskers. Now, if you see this in the x-axis, you will see these three colors. This is preoperative intraocular pressure, intraocular pressure at six weeks and intraocular pressure at last visit of a study perhaps a glaucoma surgical study or a glaucoma medical study, right? So intraocular pressure preoperatively. Now, if you see, this is the box, okay? The central line in that box is the median value, 
Okay. The extent of the box, the lower and the upper extent of the box is the 25th and the 75th percentile. You know, it's the same way you arrange those numbers from lower to higher. The 25th percent, you know, the 25th uh, percentage value will be the 25th percentile that way, right? So uh, this is the 25th percentile, this is the 75th percentile. And this whole box, you know, constitutes so this is the box and whisker wala box. Now, what are these whiskers? The lower whisker is the 10th percentile and the upper whisker is the 90th percentile or close to this most of the time. It could be 92nd, 93rd percentile also. Okay, but then these are extents of, uh, you know, how that variable is being described. And then you see that there are these dots. These dots are very far away and these are called outliers. Okay, statistically, these are called outliers. Now, you know, so preoperatively, this is the mean int uh, median intraocular pressure is somewhere around say 18 millimeters mercury. The 25th, uh, you know, the 25th percentile is somewhere around say perhaps 16 and that 75th percentile is say 20, 22. Then you have 90th percentile is somewhere around say 38 or so. And then you have two people who have like 55, 56 millimeters mercury, right? So these are very high IOPs compared to what was. You know, so why did this happen? It sometimes could be, you know, so why I'm telling you this is you need to ask a statistician to tell every continuous variable should will have outliers. So you need to ask a statistician to identify, identify them. And when you know that, you know, this person is having IOP, which is very high, you can look at their file again and see whether that is true. Sometimes, you know, people would have entered instead of 36, they have mistakenly entered 56. That's about it. You know, so that, that dis outlier disappears entirely. Isn't it? So, uh, what is the source of the outlier and can you fix it is something that you need to think about. Then you need to look at intraocular pressure at six weeks. You now, what I'm trying to tell you is this is going way beyond mean and uh, standard deviation, isn't it? You're getting to see a whole range. So, this is describing this variable entirely. This is a continuous variable. Intraocular pressure at six weeks, the median intraocular pressure, you know, is somewhere around say, uh, you know, say 15 or 16 or something it has dropped you can see clearly and these outliers have also gone away most of the times right still there are a couple of outliers and an intraocular pressure last visit was slightly higher than six weeks uh you know but it's still far below 20 and then these outliers are also slightly low so uh you know so this is how you can actually you can also show if there are two groups you can also show that you know so intraocular pressure in group one and group two at baseline then at six weeks you could have had again two such and then at uh, last visit, you could again have two such, you know, so where you can actually show comparisons between two groups, you know, so this is the best way of showing a box and whisker plot. And in categorical variables, <coughs> how do you describe that is, it's very simple. It's just proportions of percentages, right? When it's number of men, you say there are 20 out of 40 were men and that is 50%, you know, whatever that may be. And, you know, if you say, uh, you know, intraocular, uh, sorry, if you say, you know, type of injection or whatever, you will say injection one was given to 20%, injection two was given to say 60% and injection three was given to the rest of the 30% or whatever, you know, so categorical variable, there is no mean, median and too many different things, right? And so it's just N and percentage. And how do you show it is again, easy. You show it as bar diagrams. Uh, so I don't, I, I don't think I put it up, but anyway, you know, it's relatively easy to show bar diagrams. So best way to show categorical variables is using bar diagrams, right? Now we come to analytic statistics. Remember, we are talking about only one column as yet. No, we're talking about everything we know about that one column. However, it's, it's a whole cricket team who are playing all 11 are playing, or it's a whole study where we have 20 variables. All of them are going to interact with each other. You know, so in a cricket team, they're going to interact and then it's either a win or a loss or whatever. Same way, the statistic, you know, these, uh, you know, these variables. So, you know, we are almost humanizing them, right? Now, these variables are going to interact with each other. You know, so there may be two groups or there may be three groups or, you know, if one increases, the other variable also increases, uh, you know, something like that. So, uh, you know, it's like, intra, uh, say, retinopathy prematurity, the more the gestational age, you know, the higher the birth weight generally you know, and uh, the lower the chances of uh, ROP or whatever, you know, so when one increases, does the other increase or decrease uh, or, uh, you know, is there significant difference uh, between groups is all of that. So th these are analytic statistics, the three basic forms, uh, this can't be uh, sort of, uh, it can't be simplified beyond this. So there are three different forms. One is a difference between variables. Second is correlations and the third are association between variables. And so we won't have a lot of time to look into all of these, but we'll look at difference between variables, you know. Now, 
these are some of the tests that we choose based on these type of variables, right? Suppose we are looking at a difference in continuous variables between two groups, you know, say uh, open lobe injury and closed lobe injury, or you say bacterial fungal ulcer, uh, bacterial corneal ulcer and fungal corneal ulcer, you know, whatever that you are actually comparing across or say intravitreal aflibercept and intra intravitreal ranibizumab, you know, whatever that may be, or fake emulsification versus SICS, you know, so when you're comparing across two groups and that comparison you're talking about is, is a continuous variable, say age. So are FACO patients older than SICS patients? Remember that age is going to be expressed in mean and standard deviation because it's a continuous variable, right? Now, if it's normally distributed, how do you know it is normally distributed? By looking at the standard deviation, I've already told you this. If the standard deviation is more than half the mean, Right? This is very important. When the standard deviation is more than half the mean, it is not normally distributed. Or that is called non-parametric distribution. If it is normally distributed, then the standard deviation will be relatively small. This is a, you know, a relatively broad way of looking at it. There are many tests which we can do to find out normality of distribution. Okay, The commonest test that we use is the conglomerate of Smirnoff test. There are other tests like the Wilcox and Ransom test. Okay, and there is another test called the Man Whitney U test. I'm sure you would have heard these terminologies sometimes. Okay, so when we're looking at a continuous variable difference between two groups, and that variable is normally distributed, we use the student t test. If it is not normally distributed, that is, the standard deviation is very large and all, what we use is the Wilcox and Ransom test, also called as the Man Whitney test. If there are more than two groups, it's possible, right? Why only FACO SICS? You will say FACO SICS and say femto cataract or whatever. Now, there could be three groups. There could be more than two groups, of course. And when it's a continuous variable and normally distributed, we use the ANOVA. ANOVA is the analysis of variance. Okay. So these are the tests that we use. And when it's a categorical variable and we have two groups, say gender or uh, you know something like that, and uh, you know so that means it is in proportions or percentages. You know, remember that sixty percent and fifteen percent and all that we were talking about. When you're comparing across two groups and your outcome, you know, and that variable that you're comparing is a categorical variable, we use the chi-square test. Okay, so cat stands, cat goes to chi, categorical is chi-square. Now, if that proportion, those percentages are really small and less than 5%, we use a Fisher exact variation of the chi-square test. Okay, so this, these are the tests that we use. Another way of looking at it is you look at the type of the variable, whether it's a continuous or a categorical variable, then you look at the number of groups that you're comparing them across. If it is two groups or more, more than two groups. So this is taken from the uh, ebook that I already showed you the QR code for, and I'll show that QR code again. Then you look at the distribution of that continuous variable. If it's a normal distributed or not normal, right? Now, if it's a continuous variable and there are two groups and it's a normally distributed variable, you use the student t test. I've already shown you this. If it is two groups and it's not normally distributed, we use the rank sum test. Again, you know, this is how that, you know, the flow chart goes. If it is more than two groups and it's normally distributed, then we use the ANOVA. I'll go back again. You know, so if it is more than two groups and it is not normally distributed, something that I haven't shown, you know, to not confuse you, but that can also arise, right? There are three groups and the distribution that age is not normally distributed. There are some outliers there. Then we use the Kursal Wallace test it's given here. Okay. If it's a categorical variable and either two or more groups doesn't matter. And of course the distribution does again, doesn't matter. There is no normality and not because it varies from zero to hundred and that's about it. Then we use the chi-square test. And if these percentages are small, we use the Fisher exact test. <coughs> uh, I've already talked to you about what are p-values. This is one of my blogs on the website on Sengupta's Research Academy. And you can read some of the blogs, which are really useful. I think we've already talked about how to interpret these p-values. Let's look at this question that we started up again. With right, so the central macular thickness reduced from 480 uh, plus or minus 130 to 320 plus or minus 80, and from 489 uh, plus or minus 140 to 340 plus or minus 90 microns at three months follow up. Now, this is in microns, this is central macular thickness, it's in microns, right? And you have means and standard deviation. So, is this a continuous or a categorical variable? It's the first thing that you need to answer, right? I'll go back to this one, you know. So, is it a continuous or a categorical variable? So, this is clearly a continuous variable. How many groups are there? We know there is aflibercept and ranibizumab. So there are two groups. Now, is it normally distributed or not? You will need to see the standard deviations. Is the standard deviation is more than half the mean? It's not, right? So if you look at 480, half of that is 240. But here it is just 130, right? Again, this is 489 plus or minus 140, right? That means, you know, so again, this 140 is 
fairly low. You know, the standard deviation were not large. That means this is likely to be normally distributed. Again, if you see the post op values, they are also like that. Standard deviations are relatively small. Right. So this is a continuous variable that is macular thickness. We have, are comparing it across two groups and it is normally distributed. So we use the student t-test. Right. And the question asked here is, is there significant difference between these? Right. And the output that we get is a p-value. I have already told you how to interpret that p-value. So how to get this p-value is by using student t-test. Right. It's relatively simple to understand. This is another example of a study from COVID that I did and it's now published. So there were two groups. One was a control group and the other was a group which received ram remdesivir injections. And there are 221 patients in the control group and 262 patients in the remdesivir group. This is some basic demographics and systemic status. When you see age, mean age is 57 plus uh, 0.1 plus minus 12.9 in the control group, 58.8 plus minus 12.3 in the remdesivir group. Now, again, you know, let's go back here again. This is a continuous variable. There are two groups. It is normally distributed. So we use the student t-test. And this p-value is gotten using the student t-test. Let's look at gender. 141 out of 221 are men. That is 64% are men. In remdesivir, 70% are men. Now, about seven. You know, that's about 6% more. Is it significantly different to later on influence and other things? We don't know, right? So you do a statistical test. And here we do the chi-square test. And we get this p-value 0.18. You know, so this is where this is a categorical variable. Why? Because it's in percentages, percentage of men. Number of groups is two. Doesn't matter if it's more or less. And those percentages are far more than small. They're not small, right? 60%, 70%. So we use the chi-square test. Okay. So this is basically what we do. When you look at diabetic status, this p-value is statistically significant. It's 0 0.001. That means 99.9% .9 times you will get the same outcome, right? Uh, and that means in this remdesivir group, 41% are diabetic and this control group, 26% are diabetic. So there is significantly more diabetics in the remdesivir group, right? Now, if you say that this remdesivir caused mucormycosis, suppose later on, somebody says, oh, remdesivir caused mucormycosis, will it be the right way to look at it? Obviously not. That's because they have a lot more diabetics, right? So it's very likely that the diabetes caused mucormycosis or led to mucormycosis and not remdesivir or not COVID, isn't it? So now we know like uncontrolled diabetes leads to mucormycosis. So uh, this diabetes in this relationship between remdesivir and mucormycosis becomes a confounder here, right? So that's what we are trying to, you know, that's just one of the things that this can also tell us. You know, so how will it matter if there are more men in one group than the other? Does gender influence, uh, you know, outcomes in remdesivir? We don't know those things, but it's important to do all these tests right at the beginning, right? So there's another study, another example of, uh, you know, a niche glaucoma surgical study. This is comparing Ahmad glaucoma valve versus RD. I'm sure a lot of you have heard about RD. RD is the Arvind aqueous drainage implant, right? RD. So it's available for the last five or six years, an extremely good implant. Both of these cause reduction in intraocular pressure. You know, let's look at age here. In the AGV, it is 52.6 plus or minus 16.8. So this is, and in the RD, it is 47.8 plus or minus 16.7, right? Now, do you think, so there are two groups. This is a continuous variable, clearly. There are two groups. These are normally distributed, isn't it? Because the standard deviation is very small compared to the mean. Now, therefore, this p-value will be got using the student t-test, right? Now, let's look at some percentages, say, laterality, or let's say, again, gender. Or let us look at, uh, you know, this fake status at the bottom. So 70 out of uh, these, these 170 in the AGV had uh, were fake eek, that is had the crystalline lens, that is 37%. And the RD group out of the 201, 85 are fake eek, that is 41%. Now this 37 and 41% are relatively close, but still, you know, this P value is 0.41. Now we have got that using the chi-square test, right? Now, what we looked at initially is so far as differences between variables. There are other ways of doing statistics which are more uh, complicated and which are more uh, you know, sophisticated. The, the, the commonest one is called regression analysis. Okay, Again, it depends upon the type of outcome measure your outcome measure is. If it's a continuous variable, your outcome measure, you know, uh, uh, you use a linear regression. The best example of this is intraocular power calculation using the SRK and SRKT formulas. The outcome measure is the power of the IOL, right? It's in diopters. 
Okay, so you know you have heard about uh, regression formulas and theoretic formulas, right? So this regression formula it comes from that word regression comes from this term linear regression. So if an outcome measure is a continuous variable, you are you will use a linear regression. Categorical variable is the outcome measure. You will use logistic regression, and the output is mentioned using odds ratios. You would have heard about some of these terms. Unfortunately, we don't have enough time to go into a lot of nitty gritties of these. If the outcomes is counts data, then we use something called Poisson regression, and this is coming more and more in terms of you know number of steps walked in a day and you know all of that. So it is coming in more and more. And when you have survival uh, data, that means uh, you know fa failure rates or you know whatever percentage, it's a proportion, but what is important is time to reach that event, you know, so failure in surgery or death, five year survival rates in cancer. These are all those regressions are calculated using Cox proportional hazards models. But, you know, if you just remember continuous and categorical, because they are the two types we looked at, you use linear regression or logistic regression. Now, what is the power of regression is to find causality, you know? So when there is one outcome, you know, same euchre mycosis, that is a yes, no, right? Did somebody get mucor? Yes, no. And there are so many things which can cause it. Diabetes, you know, use of corticosteroids, older age, and, you know, like say remdesivir or some drug that you think might cause it, you know, whatever. So there are three or four possible ones which could lead to that outcome. Now, which one actually led to that outcome and which are the other two or three where that association is spurious? It is not actually the case. Let's look at another example. You know, say outcome is uh, cystoid macular edema after cataract surgery, you know, so that's a yes, no, based on what you have used as a definition. Now we're looking at risk factors for that outcome to happen. You know, so what are the possible possibilities, you know, PCR, yes, no, then whether you used FACO or SICS, yes, no, uh, you know, and so many others. So which of these is actually the causative when which of the others are spurious or are confounders? is what you can find, find using regression analysis. So when you're looking at one causative versus one outcome, it is called, it is called univariate analysis. And when you're looking at multiple factors and putting them all together and trying to find, you know, their uh, causality towards the outcome, it is called a multivariable analysis. And the last example we'll take is, uh, you know, say uh, endothelial cell loss after cataract surgery. And then, you know, your main, uh, variable that you're trying to study is FACO and SICS. Okay. So what are the other things which will lead to this endothelial loss, age, type of cataract, uh, you know, visco, type of visco used, so many other things, right? Now, suppose SICS has more denser cataracts and much older patients. And later on, you will see that SICS has led to more loss of, uh, of endothelial count. Is it true to blame SICS? It's not right because, uh, you know, older people, even in the FACO group may have had more loss, right? So age is probably the most important here, which is causing this outcome. So that age is the main thing, right? Everything else is not, but then if you don't do this analysis, you will continue to blame SICS, you know, unfortunately. So then only when you do a regression, can you actually find what is that causality? Okay. So that's very important. This is that, uh, you know, I'm going to show you, so we are coming to an end. So I'll, I'm going to show you the uh qr code of this book on basics of biostatistics and if you want you can actually scan this again okay and you can download that ebook and you can you can actually just go through it you will get all this information that you've talked about continuous categorical or you know uh outliers and uh box and whisker plots and all of that Okay, you know, you can just pause it when whenever you're watching it again, you can just pause it and do this. And this is also another you know, interesting quiz on, <coughs> on biostatistics. It just takes about five minutes. And once you submit, you will get a score. And, you know, it's just going to be on whether it's continuous, categorical, and, you know, what tests are to be used. Just a quick revision of what, you know, you've actually done through this, uh, through this exercise so that, you know, it really helps it, uh, you know, sort of go deeper. I think this, I think most of we've looked at these slides last time also. So, you know, these free lectures are the ones where you'll get to see what Professor Amod Gupta, Dr. Santosh Bunavar and others have to talk about clinical research. And, uh, you know, these e-learning modules, they are, uh, of course, paid, but then, you know, you'll get a lot of information about literature review and uh, 
all of this about biostatistics and so much more than what we have discussed now. As you can see, communication with a biostatistician is, is a lecture which we didn't have enough time for today. Bio, advanced biostatistics talks about all these regressions in so much more detail, right? Then, uh, so a lot to learn on the website. Then there is another module on manuscript writing and uh, where, you know, we look at uh, choosing a journal to how to write original articles, to case reports and other things. And then last, uh, but not the least, how do we deal with rejections? What a reviewer really wants? Uh, you know, all of that can also be learned, including reference managers. This is a more advanced course. Uh, you know, residents and fellows can really uh, you know push your uh, publication journey uh, many fold. If you get enrolled in some of these uh, fellowship courses, you can take a look at this uh, on uh, on the website. We won't spend more time on this. Uh, so there is another course on you know thesis guidance and all you can all take a look at on the website uh you know it's a lot of uh, good blogs on the website like uh, blogs on regression analysis uh, thesis to journal article uh, you know sample size and all of those so how to interpret odds ratios so please take a look at some of those and broaden your research horizons it's really going to be important as we go along to you know have better perspectives of some of these uh, and this is a Facebook group that all of you can actually join. This is on ophthalmic research and collaborations in India, where you know some of us put put forward ideas for research, and then others say, "Oh, we would be interested in doing it." And then there have been four or five uh, groups which have already started working and are on the verge of publishing papers. So you know, if you ever want to get uh, hold of new ideas or uh, when collaborations are happening, this is the Facebook group to be on. So thank you so much, and I hope you know this uh, subject of biostatistics will not be too much of an enigma, and then you'll be able to wrap your heads uh, around that. I'm happy to take questions now. Uh, you... Thank you so much, sir, for such a wonderful and a unique lecture. It was one of a kind. Uh, one of the users is asked, "Can you please share that how your academy helps with data analysis?" Yeah, so <clears throat> you know, so basically, what we do is uh, uh, let me quickly try and show you what we do. Sure. I think there is an image. Yeah. So I'll just share it. And this is essentially what we do, right? I mean, this is the point of first contact where you know you write to us or tell us what is your need, what you really want to have. <clears throat> and then you know what we do is we do our own research because you know we need to find that gap in literature, right? So we do our own. PubMed and other Scopus search, and we review literature and to find what has not been done or find gap in what has is is existing, right? And then we need to do statistics to fill that gap. You know, the goal of statistics or writing is to fill that gap. So you know, a lot of people have a lot of data, but then that gap is is not existing so far in their minds. You know, so we generally communicate and say, oh, you know, it will be better to uh, you know divert our uh, resources towards this gap. And then we do the analysis and once the analysis is done, it is goal directed, then, you know, the outcome of this analysis is the result section of a paper where you get the text, the uh, statistical analysis section, along with tables, figures, and whatever is required. And then if necessary, we can, you know, we also help writing in uh, the whole manuscript, right? So again, it is, uh, you know, all sections will be based on the type of journal that we're looking for, you know, whether it's a case report or case series and all, and then, you know, we just send it back to the, the author for submitting. But this is generally what we do. So you know, we actually helped some some people who just had an Excel, but that was really rich, you know. And then that has gotten into JAM ophthalmology. So then it can work that way. But then uh, you know, I would still recommend most of you to you know put in your own efforts and try and do this on your own. If you get stuck, then you know my academy and is of course there with uh, though there is a fee to it. But then you know your seniors or you know your peers could also chip in and you know we could come up with something which you know something better than what me and my team could do so uh, at least try and put in efforts if, if you're stuck you can take assistance however you know that assistance will make so much more sense to you because you tried if you don't try you won't go too far you know so you know, that's sort of the caveat to that question very true sir so the next question is how do you apply and make yourself eligible for research grants? Yeah, so, uh, you know, first and foremost, uh, grants are not very easily available in India. Um, so eligibility for grants doesn't, um, you know, it depends on the CV of the person who is applying, of course, but then it's not entirely or totally dependent on that. 
you know so you need to show that brand agency that this is very important to do this uh, this research is extremely important to do and it is going to have far reaching ramifications you know what i mean so uh, that means that gap in literature that, that you have found is really important isn't it so if you know so so many people don't write papers saying oh there's no point because too much has already been done and that is the right approach because you, you are otherwise littering littering it you know by just writing too many papers one after the other so write meaningful papers you know and pe- you will notice that you know people who have written fewer papers 50 60 perhaps or even 10 and 12 will come up with better ideas you know because they are not blurting out like five or six papers every month it's not always good to do that sometimes it is if you are an institution which is has that power you could do that but then you know it's good to sit on ideas think about it so your idea or that question that you're asking is the first and foremost which will make you eligible for any grant then you have to show that you are capable enough to do it to execute that plan right it's it's very well that you have a great question oh but then you know you don't have the number of patients you don't have the number of uh, you know sort of the equipment required you don't have the statistical background and other things and then you have to show that i'll be able to publish this that is where your publication history comes comes into into play and of course you know if somebody has 10 papers and somebody has two papers then it's likely that the grant agency may look at the person who has slightly higher number of papers provided they are all original articles grant agencies do not look at case reports they do not look at anything else other than original reports not even reviews so if somebody has like 15 publications and all are original articles and some somebody has like 80 publications but all are case reports then you, know, you can very well understand who is going to be the advantage at an advantage it's going to be the, some person who's writing more original articles so right from the beginning write original articles M- do meaningful work meaningful work also is going to be cited more and more and more so you'll have a high citation index and h index and all of that as you go ahead right but then to be eligible for a grant you need to have the right question you need to have the right resources to carry out that execute that plan and the resources uh, to publish papers so this is pretty much what grant agencies look for all right sir. thank you sir and the next question is any tips on how to effectively present the statistical analysis you know like i already said you need to visualize and think about what will go into tables what will go into figures and then what else will go into the text do not repeat things in tables and then into the text at the same time it's it's ir- irritating it's you know time consuming for the reviewer and then you know when it's going to get published that uh, publisher will say oh one whole page can be removed if we remove this you know and that makes huge amount of difference in terms of printing and money being spent you know just looking at it downstream so then don't repeat things first is design your tables you know so if you have two groups perhaps the first table could be comparison between demographics like i showed you for the dream disease study the second uh, uh, table would be the more important one where you're talking about the primary outcome say iop and you know at different time points and others and then perhaps another table on complications or you know whatever you might have additionally uh, so you know say three tables like that or say another table on advanced statistics like regressions or something like that you know so it's 50 60 percent of your work should be able uh, you know should be seen in the standalone tables and then maybe another 20 percent will be in terms of figures or graphs that you make you know so box and whisker plots i showed you bar diagrams or you know of this, you know some of this uh, you know scatter diagrams and there are many that your statistician can help you with so the, another 20 percent of your data is presented in uh, in graphs or figures so almost 80 percent is done here you know so about 20 percent will be in text and then you know you but then you have to cite that table one right so you will say table one shows you know whatever you or you just say uh, you know this group had significantly older people with more uh, this 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 and in bracket you will say table one so then you get a citation and then you know that conclusion of that basic table is also there in that so that's pretty much how you do it so you design your tables then you fill them up of course with the help of your statistician and you make meaningful graphs so it will show things better and then you write the text yes uh thank you so much sir that's all the questions we have for tonight and before we call it a day i would like like to make an announcement for the next week's uh i focus session we have it on essentials of ophthalmic anatomy part one by dr partho pratim datta majunda sir thank you so much sir for sparing all your time such wonderful knowledge it was a very good insight into the biostatistics part the quite unraveled uh, part of 
uh, medicine i would say and thank you so much sir, for sparing the time tonight uh, thank you so much good night